Good morning, Judge Coppin. Uh, please switch on your mic and you can keep it on. Sorry, until the morning, end of your morning Chief Justice. How are you this morning? No, I'm fine. Good, good. Uh, I haven't seen you in a very long time, so I think you have been very busy at the SCA. Relatively busy. <laughs> Relatively busy. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you very much for making yourself available for consideration for appointment to the SCA and for coming to this interview this morning. Um, we will ask you questions aimed at uh, satisfying us whether <clears throat> we should uh, advise the president to appoint you as a judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. In doing so, we will have due regard to the selection criteria that we have adopted um, as the commission. So our questions will be aimed at seeing whether those criteria are satisfied. Um, you will be treated fairly. Uh, nobody who is here uh, wants to just uh, make sure that you don't get appointed. Everybody wants to just make a fair assessment of um, your abilities with regard to the Supreme Court of Appeal. You understand? Yes. I will ask you some questions, and thereafter I will allow the president of the SCA to put questions to you, and thereafter the minister, and after that uh, uh, other commissioners who might wish to ask you questions. You have supplied the commission with a lot of information, which we have in our bundle, uh, all that information is taken as read, and uh, in asking questions, we will simply seek to focus on certain areas that we are in, we we would like to get answers uh, on from you. I see that you obtained BA and LLB uh, from the University of Veterans Is that right? That is correct. And before you. Uh, went to the bar, you were a teacher teaching accountancy and later on part-time lecturer at VETS, is that correct? No, I was actually, a, I would say a full-time lecturer at VETS, but for six months. Oh, you, you were full-time, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I thought part-time, but uh, that was for about six months, seven months. For well, about six, I tried to, because I thought I can finish my master's degree Oh. Uh, but I was also trying to combine it with practice at the bar. Yes. And it didn't work because financially I couldn't survive. Uh, so I went back to the bar. Yes. And I, yeah. And you started uh, at the bar in 1985. <laughs> 1 July 1985. Yes. And in 2010, you took, you took silk. No, 2005, you took silk. I took, I took silk in... Uh, and in 2010, you became a judge yes. of the High Court in uh, Johannesburg, is that right? That is so. And uh, so that means you have been a judge for um, 13 years or so? No, no, it's actually, hmm? I mean, my 15th year now. Oh, you are in your 15th year In fact, now. I'm already qualifying for my... <laughs> I'm supposed to get in the next few weeks. Oh, so I see why you're emphasizing 15th year. <laughs> yes, and, that, and um, you have acted in the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, quite a few times, is that right? That is so. Uh, the first time you acted was from December 2016 to 31 May 2017. And thereafter, you started on 1 December 23 to 31 March 2024, and you say possibly next term too. Yes. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, it, it's not possible now. It is so. Is that right? It is so, yes. Yes. Now, in the High Court, are you able to share with the commissioners what branches of law you have been able to write judgments in? The purpose of this question is to enable you to 
tell the commissioners the breadth of your experience as a judge. So what branches of law have you had a chance to write judgments in? Well, being in the High Court in Johannesburg, you're actually exposed to a very, very wide um, range of matters. And I've been, I mean, I've never written, for example, I, the thing I can exclude would be say, I never wrote on maritime law, for example. But yeah, somewhere along the line, I was exposed so. to it, yeah. yeah. Being in Jobek, understandably so. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, but otherwise one would have been exposed to bits of everything, I would think. Do, do you want to specify branches of law where you have written judgment? That might help than being general, just to make sure the, the commissioners are aware well, of their breadth law, of experience. Contract, tax. Tax. Company law, contract, tax, criminal law. Uh, trademarks. Um, you don't see too much of that in the High Court anymore. I mean, uh, maybe bits of it. As I say, I, I had exposure to that in practice. Yeah. Um, but in the High Court, you don't, don't see much of that. Mm. Customary law? Customary law, not really, no. Yes. Not in Joba. Constitutional law? I've written a bit on constitutional law, yes. Yes actually my favorite part. Yes. And um, in the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, during the activities that you have had, um, what kind of, what branches of law have you had a chance to write judgments in? I think uh, criminal law, contract, uh, I think in those two areas. If you uh, say a contract and and criminal law, I think. Yes. Uh, well, in the context of the Supreme Court of Appeal, maybe I'm being unfair if I just uh, limit but, but you. But I have said in all. Limit you. In a, in a whole, <laughs> yeah, a just hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe I'm being unfair to you if, in the context of the Supreme Court of Appeal, I limit you to uh, branches of law where you have written judgments. Oh, Maybe you I'm, can share also uh, branches of law where you you were part of the panels, even if somebody else wrote a judgment. And as I said, right now I'm, I'm writing on insurance law in that court. But I'm I haven't completed. Uh, sorry, your, 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 your voice. Come closer to the mic so that we can hear you. Uh, you are I writing on insurance I, law at the moment? Insurance lawyers. Yes. Uh, in terms of panels where you are sitting, what branches of law? Administrative law, involved? constitutional type of law. But administrative law, uh, mainly. But also things like um, uh, property law issues. So for me, I don't really see the distinctions between these branches. It's all law. <laughs> yes. Um, can you share with the commissioners your uh, understanding of what the doctrine of the separation of powers is? Well, every every um, sphere. I mean, the different spheres of government, being the state. I'm sorry, Judge Coppin. Can the commissioners state. all hear him clearly? Can you hear me clearly? Okay, it looks like they do. Okay. There are different spheres of government, different. the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. And each must actually, each has different functions to fulfill. And one must just usually make sure that you keep it in your line, if you look at it from that perspective. That's really what it's about. And the rule of law? The rule of law, it's got lots of facets to it. It could mean, but technically it means that we shouldn't be resorting to self-help and vigilantism. We should be ruled by law. Uh, president of the SCA. Okay. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning, Justice Coppin. Good morning. Um, 
um, Justice Cook, I'm just following up on one of the questions that was posed to you by the Chief Justice uh, regarding the spectrum of laws that you, you've had exposure to. Maybe I should just put the question differently to say, which new areas of law did you get exposure to when you were at the SCM? Something new that you had not been exposed mm, no, to I, before? No, I was not exposed to any new area. Uh, you have not yet participated? You were not um, a member of a panel in a maritime matter? Not yet, no. or a Or a trademark matter? No. Not yet, I see. All right, so um, you indicated that you have been a judge for 15 years. Um, but you'd agree that one's experience before appointment to the bench is also critical. Yes. Yes. Um, it would seem from my calculation that before joining the bench, you were in the legal profession for approximately 25 years. I would say 24, but 24. I still said 25. 25. <laughs> I see. Um, so before being invited to act in the, at the SCA uh, last year, um, you had last, last acted there in 2017. Is that, that is right? So. Okay. That is so. Yes. Now, on your return to the SCA, how did you find the environment? Well, it had completely changed. As I said, uh, I actually went there with reservations, but I heard that it had changed. And uh, when I got there, I was pleasantly surprised by the change. Yes, um, what, what stands out in terms of the change that you are referring to? Well, I must say the emotional IQ has gone up quite a lot. Hmm. There's a lot more collegiality. People yes. tend to work together more easily. Uh, they're less uh, big egos, uh, because I remember my first nasty experience when I acted, the first time is I had to write a dissenting judgment, and uh, that set the tent for me. That's in 2016, my first week, my first matter, I couldn't agree with the presider. And I had, to, I had the task of having to write a dissent and I was visited by all kinds of people that said, this is not the way we do things here. Mustn't come and do it like this and like that. And I just thought my, I mean, because I, I, at that time, I had already sat in the LAC, which had a completely different environment. There we could easily differ from each other, easily discuss matters, which was not the people basically uh, had the, the, the attitude that would, how dare you? How dare you? And that's what stuck in my mind. So I didn't enjoy that first. Let me put it this way. I didn't enjoy that first part. Yes. But you say now the... It's uh, a completely uh, different thing. Yes. The environment has changed for the better in terms of collegiality. Would you say that collegiality is important? I think it's very, very important because I've said as a single judge, I've made mistakes. And I know that those mistakes wouldn't have happened if I sat with colleagues, because they may have been able to see those perspectives. I think that's why you have multiple judges sitting in matters, so that what you don't see, I mean, we're, after all, we're human. I'm not sitting here as a perfect human being. Yeah. I've got my faults. I've got my weaknesses. I make mistakes. But your colleague is likely to pick it up, and that's what I really uh, appreciate from that type of work. Would you say that um, the writing of judgments at an appellate level is pretty much a collaborative exercise? Absolutely. Absolutely a collaborative exercise. That's why I was happy when at some stage there was a requirement that we had to put up our judgments that we wrote as judges, you know, single judges. And that would actually give you some indication of what I'm able to do as a single judge. But collaboratively, it's a collaborative effort. Because if I listen to my colleague and, and he comes with a suggestion, I'm persuaded by Alex. Either 
I can either accept it or go on board or not. But it, in the end of the day, it enriches me. Uh, and I look at it in that, in that way. Okay, so it being a collaborative exercise, then the uh, handing down of judgments also depends on um, how quickly colleagues respond to that, the scribe's judgment. Is that, that correct? That is in fact so. Yes. That is in fact so because what happens if you give someone a draft, some colleagues would take a bit long to come back and that has a knock on effect, which would mean that the judgment gets handed down much later. Yes. Have you ever delayed? Uh, no, the, not at all. Yeah, either through not giving inputs or giving inputs. No, late. no. I usually tend to my input immediately. It's like with petitions, I read them immediately. Yes. I try to do that. Yes. All right. So, um, you know. For I example, must just qualify it by saying I was given a judgment. Yes. I think on Friday, and I ask a colleague, I just need to prepare for this before I actually would, would respond to the colleague. So if that constitutes delay, it's something that I've told the colleague about. Yes, but generally you, you hand down your judgments promptly. That is so. As I say, there's been a bit of a problem there in that court now, I saw with the researchers, where sometimes the judgment is given to the researchers, and there's a bit of a delay there. Yes. Uh, but that's only... Yes. Yes, you, you are alluding to a very important aspect, um, the inadequate research capacity at the SEA. Would you say that in itself then speaks to the need for judges that are appointed to that court to be self-reliant in terms of doing your own research prior to the hearing and doing research in, in uh, preparing your own judgment? No, I think so. I think you must do the best that you can. Yes. mustn't rely on the fact that the researchers will be doing it for you. Yes. Fortunately, that's always been my habit. Even in the high court, I, I almost never relied on the researcher. But I'm not saying that the researcher's role is insignificant. I, I think they play a very, very important role. can only enrich your judgment by making use of a researcher. But I don't think one must become totally dependent on the researcher. Yes. So um, you'd agree that uh, judicial experience is important as well as your overall uh, skill set? No, absolutely. And yes. it actually, it, you, you actually see it when you're dealing with petition because they come in at the time when you're at your busiest. So you must be able to read it and immediately have that feel. And that feel only comes with experience. What special attributes would you bring to the table at the SCA? I think I've got experience over all these years. As I said, I'm not perfect. I, I, I've also got a lot still to learn. For me, life is a, it's a learning experience. I never stop learning. I don't know all the answers. Yes. But I think I have the experience. Uh, I wouldn't have applied much, much earlier than what I've applied. Now, as if I wasn't sure that I could make a difference, I wouldn't have applied. All right, uh, so my last question is, uh, um, obviously you receive uh, inputs from other colleagues. Have you had to change your judgment or to amend it on substantive issues because of the inputs that you received? No, no I've colleagues? never really got, I had to change on sub, my yes. judgment substantively. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, Minister. I am fine. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. JP. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Good morning, Judge Coppin. Um, you've set extensively as an appellate court judge in the LAC. Am I correct? I can't hear you. Please switch on your mic. And then you can sorry. keep it on until the end I'm of the interview. I'm sorry about that. I've, I've just finished, about to finish my tenure term that I was appointed for in that court. Um, and you have also presided in full court appeals in, in the in division? Court, yes. Right. 
your appellate court experience in the LAC, um, do you think that has equipped you uh, sufficiently to sit in the SCA? I think it has, but I must just say that different styles of writing. I mean, uh, the LAC has its own strengths, the way they do things, some things I admire greatly, which we don't find in the LAC. Yes. And, uh, you know, it would obviously enrich the LAC judgments, as I've said earlier. But the LAC, the, 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 the problem in the, the SC, as I've indicated earlier, to do with personalities, the way things were done, whereas in the LAC, there's open, always been this openness, which meant you grew quite quickly, and it was a pleasant experience to discuss with your colleagues. Um, but as I say, the way the SCA goes about the business, the rigorousness of checking judgments and of making certain everything is, I think that could be emulated in the LAC. And as I say, while there we tried, but but yeah. but um, that could help. Yes. And uh, can you confirm that you've never had a problem with reserve judgments? No, uh, I, I actually dislike them because I found if you reserve them for too long, sometimes one is forced to reserve. I mean, I have reserved because of circumstances beyond my control. But it's something one doesn't encourage. I try to tackle the task immediately and get it done with. You, you've never been reported. You've never reserved longer than three months. Well, I you see someone in one of the comments. I haven't really counted whether it was three months. Someone mentioned that I had reserved for four months. I don't know. I've never checked. Okay, thank you very much, CJ. Thank you. Commissioner Diodorov. Uh, thank you very much, CJ. Good morning, Justice. I want to follow up the question that CJ asked you about the branches of law. And in your response, you said it's only maritime law that you are not involved in. Sorry, yes. uh, I'm sorry, uh, Judge Coppin. Keep your mic uh, on, it, it, please. It goes off. Some. <laughs> it goes <laughs> off. Not. I think I said trademark and pace. I haven't encountered those yet. Maritime law. Somewhere along my practice, I had encountered it. So. No, it's okay. It's okay. I, I'm not there. I was just. Uh, uh, please switch on your what mic. You... Um, one second, Commissioner Judo. Secretariat, why is the candidate's mic giving problems today? Um, most of the time they can keep it on without any problems. Will you attend to it? Okay, all right. Thank you. Commissioner. I, I wanted to ask you about public international law. South Africa is a signatory to the Rome Statute. Uh, we are a member to certain international organizations and obviously there are two courts the international criminal court and the international court of justice which are both in the hague what is the difference between the two please switch on your mic <laughs> one will deal with criminal matters purely and the other one would deal with all other kinds of matters. Can we elaborate that? What kind of, there are there specific differences between the two courts, why they were established, dealing with international matters. Uh, and I want to test your knowledge in terms of the difference between the two. South Africa has featured quite prominently lately in respect I, I, of- I must be honest to say to you that I'm not, it was one of my favorite areas of law, public international law. I haven't followed those developments too closely. I haven't had matters in that area. And therefore you don't know the difference between the two. 
You mean the two courts? Yes. Not in that. You, you just say that the other one deals with criminal matters. That's yeah. That's. But there are distinct differences between the two. I, I'm sure there would be. Yes. They, they are, and you are not familiar with that. No. Okay, it's fine then. Uh, Chief Justice, I was going to follow up certain things regarding that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Marmohai. Thank you very much, CJ. Good morning, Judge Kobe. Morning. Um, I, I had a question that I wanted to ask you with regards to one of your, your judgments, but there's a statement that you made um, which makes me want to ask you the question, a different question. I'm not sure if you you, you have familiarized yourself with the rules of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Have you, have you had an occasion to, to, to look at them? You know what, because you there you hit the goal. I haven't really sat down and played them. As the cases come, I would look at them. Yes. As, if they become relevant. Yes. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I always wonder when I, when I look at the rules, uh, of, of, of that court, and I always want clarity as to sometimes how things operate. Like, for instance, in the definitions, uh, the rules define a court, a, a court day, usually, as any day apart from a Saturday, Sunday, or public holiday. But when you look at the rules that deal with special appeals and leave to appeals, uh, the rules deal with a month, right? Um, which always, to me, I, I just wonder how, 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 how that should be understood. Um, because when one applies for leave to appeal to that court, um, you will be told if an order was made by the lower court on the 8th of a particular month, by the 8th of another month, you should have your, your papers in. Otherwise, you have to apply for, for condonation. Um, in your view, uh, are, are these rules consistent with how we understand the dice, how they are calculated generally um, in terms of the rules of other courts and even in terms of the directives in, in other courts? Should, should, should it be like this? Do we need a month, which is not defined in the, in the definition, or should there be like within 30 days? Will, will that not give more certainty? Yeah, because as I said, a month is ambiguous. If you say the thing like a month, because it may mean one thing to someone and something else to someone else. So ideally, one would speak about specific days, or days rather. But yeah, I mean, I do agree that there's all those options, but sometimes that's what we have and we have to interpret it as best as we can. So when you, when you assist with such a case where somebody has, let's say maybe, an order in the lower court was made on the 8th, and then the person brings an application on the 10th of the next month. Um, is it compulsory for a person to apply for, for condonation? And, those, and if the person did not apply for condonation, can that be a, a, well, a well, ground for that, dismissal? That would have to be, I mean, I would have to be persuaded one way or the other. As I say, for me, if that is the case, maybe I'll be inclined to, to condone. If, you know, if the other view is that it's not a month, uh, because it may reasonably be interpreted to be a matter. But it would be a matter of how I'm persuaded by the arguments to and fro. In a panel, the two of you, there's no case to be persuaded. You are just looking at the papers. But anyway, I will no, leave but it there. We, we, may, we may have to debate it between <laughs> us, because my, my, other, my colleague may have a different view. <laughs> Thank you very much, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner Singh. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I do not know if you are aware that uh, there are a number of students, South African students who study abroad that feel that they have been prejudiced by the HSPCA and they've even gone to court on some of these matters and the court have made findings uh, in their favor. Now, many of these students study abroad, either in Cuba or in other parts of the world, because of the lack of capacity 
uh, space capacity in South Africa. And they often feel prejudiced because when they want to come back to South Africa, they're not given an opportunity to write board examinations uh, on time or get again acceptance into medical institutions. What is your view on these uh, South African students who train abroad and want to be accepted into our uh, medical system? Thank you, Chief Justice. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know whether you're asking my view as a lawyer or just as an ordinary human being, ordinary citizen. Well, I, I, I think because you served on the HSPCA. No, uh, but the, the, the last time I served was in 2007. I don't even know how relevant my views would be now. And one doesn't know the specifics. I don't know the facts. Why they're not being treated as they think they ought to be treated. I would, I would have to know the specific facts before I can comment. So what you are saying then is in your tenure on that board, you did not become aware of the challenges no. faced by South African students. No, I think up, up to the time when I was there, uh, no, that was not the case. I was there when that board was in transition. Um, subsequent, uh, subsequent to 2007, no, I didn't really keep up with what was happening in that field. No, then I can't uh, ask you anything further if you were not there at that time. But, but, but in, in after that, you're not aware of any matters which you may not have presided over or you're not aware of matters that the South African students who study abroad are, are facing, the difficulties? I'm, I'm not aware of specifics. I mean, what I know is what I see on television or read in the paper. But I don't know all the facts. Okay, thank no, thank you very much, Chief Justice. Thank you. Commissioner Mangena. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Commissioner. Uh, Judge, Judge Coppin. You are the first judge to deal with uh, the claim of Mr. Makate against oh. Vodacom. Yes. Yes. Um, it's common knowledge that uh, that judgment went all the way to the, to the Constitutional Court. And you, you dismissed Mr. Makate's claim on two grounds. Yes. Prescription and... Um, Ostensible authority. Ostensible authority. Yes. And the Concord said that uh, you add in conflating ostensible authority with estoppel. That's right. one. Yeah. Two, and which is the basis of my question, was that you refused to, or you, is, is refused the right word? Or you were reluctant to develop the common law relating to prescription. Um, one, one doesn't out of one's own motion develop the common law. There was no case before me. There was no constitutional case before me. The case that was argued before the constitutional court was a total different case. In fact, if I'm telling you now, I don't know how I would have decided it if it was argued before me the way it was argued before the Constitutional Court. You can look at that judgment, you see the team con con uh, changed com almost completely. I had two of the, at the time, two of the most senior people against each other before me, with big teams. After they, and, and, and after they went from my court to the higher courts, the teams changed completely. The teams took on, the whole case took on a new dimension. And as I say, it may, it's possible that if what was argued before that court had been argued before me, my decision may have been something else. You know, uh, the, you, you, the question of ostensible authority was, was actually the, the basis of your dismissal of the claim. Well, the point is that's the way I obviously assessed the facts and it was my understanding of ostensible authority, that's not free from uh, uh, contestation. I mean, you can see in that particular case, there's no unanimity on that issue. I still don't know what it is now, since that particular case. If you read the academic writings, I'm interesting to see, interested to see what the next case is. 
that's going to be dealing with that particular uh, issue of ostensible authority. What it says about it. Because then we can talk. Right now, you have those different views that were expressed. Yes, there was a majority, and one accepts that. Um, but that's how law is. Okay. All right. But um, um, relying on, on precedent, do you accept? I'm bound by it. Thank and you. And I was bound in that case by precedent. In fact, in respect of the prescription issue and the other issue, I was bound by precedent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner yeah, Nyambi. Chief Justice, I do want to follow I'm up sorry. on Makate. Um, oh, yes. yes before, unless Commissioner Nyambi also wants to talk about Makate. Yes. Um, Judge, I, I mean, I, I'm interested in the point about uh, you saying that the case argued in the Constitutional Court was a different case to what was argued before you. Yes. I mean, if it's about, as Commissioner has pointed out, developing the common law. I wasn't asked to develop the common law. Yeah, but that's the point. I, 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 there was no request in the Constitutional Court to develop the common law. It was a question of the meaning of the word debt under the Prescription Act, which you also applied. Yeah, but you see, in my case, there was no contestation. There was a case, a Pella Division case. And these two senior counsel, they didn't quibble about whether or not it's applicable. In terms of precedent, that was the law. Yes. So there was no issue about me developing it further. No, that's what I'm saying. I don't read the constitutional court judgment as developing the common law. It was about what does the word debt under the prescription act mean. Yes, and then and that, that was court... the same issue before you. Yes. No, I, I appreciate that, Commissioner. No, no, I told you. Yes. No. But there, as I say, there, there were the two cases in the... So one was the appellate division, Supreme Court of Appeal, and they chose the latter one that gives a narrower definition to debt. Yes, in fact, I, mean, I always thought that the, the, the good part about your judgment was that you found that the CEO of Photocom had lied about him having developed the product, and you conducted an extensive analysis of the evidence, which has never actually been overturned throughout yes. these rounds of litigation. In fact, the basis of the further cases have been the acceptance that you were correct in rejecting, uh, I think it was Alan, yes. not Craig's lies about the fact that he developed the product. And I actually found that it was his idea. In fact, that was a very hard case for me to decide. As I say, if whatever had been argued in the Constitution, I don't know how I would have decided it, whether I would have come to the same, I don't know. But it was one of those hard cases that I had to decide. Yes, because here I saw this person has to fail because of prescription and ostensible authority. Yet his idea had been used yes. by Vodacom. And instead of owning up, they tried to cover up. Yes. Uh, not an easy case. Yes, I also got interested in your CV that the two judgments that were overturned by the Constitutional Court, Miataza and Makate, where about prescription? <laughs> so it seems, it seems you, you are very conservative on prescription. <laughs> no, well, I thought some people are very scared about prescription. In fact, if you look at the law now, the law in that court has developed to the extent, because my Taza didn't yield a, a ratio. It was a split decision, 5-5. Five, five. So if you look at the law now, in fact, uh, if, if my Taza had to be decided now, it would be a different result. I mean, I, I always thought that three years is too short without a possibility of condemnation. And that's really the problem is that they need to give five years or six years. Well, I, I think I, I'd agree with you. But as everyone says, prescription cuts both ways. Sometimes it comes to the rescue of this poor person that's being hounded by debtors. And you just feel, oh, if this prescription period had been shorter, maybe it would have been better for this person. So it cuts both ways. Prescription doesn't only hit one way. Right. Thank you, Chief Justice. Commissioner Nyambi. And thank you, CJ. Morning, Judge Kobe. Morning, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I've got just one question. 
already the president of the SCA has covered uh, your first and uh, your second experience in the SCA. Yes. So linked to that, uh, I'm interested in why do you think are the immediate challenges facing the SCA currently as we have been there and hope even last March? I think it's that challenges you... facing all the courts, in fact. It's attracting people with the necessary skills and experience. That's what's facing all our courts. It's a concern for the High Court, for the SA, and I assume for the Higher Court, the highest court in the land as well. Are you of the view that you are the right candidate to address those challenges that you have highlighted in terms of SA? Well, as I say, if, if I was not, I wouldn't put my hand up. I've, my record is there for everyone to see. I think I do, I can make a contribution. I'm not perfect, as I said. It's a challenge, um, but I'm up to the challenge, I think. Thank you, Judge Coburn. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, there are no further hands. I think we've come to the end of this interview. Thank you very much, Judge Coppin, for availing yourself. Uh, you are now excused. Thank you very much, Judge.